honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you, that it may go well with you. I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, and we're studying the fifth commandment in my series, Written in Stone. Today, we'll learn ways to honor our parents throughout our lives so we can reap the benefits of the commandment with a promise. If you have your Bible, please turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We're in a series on the Ten Commandments. We're calling this series Written in Stone because God wrote the Ten Commandments with His own finger. He carved them in stone. These are uh, commandments, obviously, to live by commandments that reveal the, the heart and the character of God what is important for us to know and to do. These aren't the Ten Suggestions, they're the Ten Commandments. And we know that the Ten Commandments were written on two tablets of stone. And the way that our minds work, we have one tablet that deals with the first four commandments, the vertical commandments, the laws of worship, as Vodi Bakum calls them. And what we're supposed to do in our vertical relationship with God, obviously that comes first. But then the next six commandments, that second tablet, if you think about it in your mind, that deals with our horizontal relationships. Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments this way when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is vertical. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So the first four commandments, vertical, loving the Lord. The next six commandments, horizontal, loving your neighbor as yourself. Now the foundation for the, for the first tablet is I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That is the foundation of everything, God only. So we worship God only. We worship God rightly, no idols. We worship God reverently. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And then honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We worship God regularly. But then he goes into the horizontal. And what does the horizontal start with? What is that hinge point? What is the foundation point for loving your neighbor as yourself? Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. It's the command with a promise. It's the only one of the ten that has a promise built in that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Now, when Moses in Deuteronomy repeats the Ten Commandments, he says this, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you on the land which the Lord your God gives you. So there's a little bit of added information that it, when you do this, here's the promise that you live long on the earth, that it goes well with you And Paul picks this up in Ephesians chapter 6 when he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. So in all caps in the New American Standard. Anytime in the New Testament, in the New American Standard, when it's in all caps, that means it's quoting from the Old Testament. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Well, who doesn't want it to go well with them? Who doesn't want to live long on the earth? You're never going to have that, God says, unless you honor your father and mother. So that's a wonderful promise for those who will do it. 
Dwight O. Moody once said, no man or woman who dishonors father or mother will ever prosper because God has fixed it. He has written it in stone. This is primary. The first two people you meet in life are father and mother, and you honor them. And if you dishonor them, you're not going to be blessed. Uh, Our society today is filled with dishonor, dishonor in the home. And we can't prosper individually, we can't prosper collectively if we're violating the fifth commandment, if we're saying, God, we don't care what you say, we're going to do it our own way. Dr. J. Gresham uh, Machen was a theologian. He died in 1937. This is what he said before he died almost 100 years ago. America is running on the momentum of a godly ancestry. When that momentum goes, God help America. We, we are seeing that momentum going. We don't have godly homes like we once did. And we don't have people obeying the fifth commandment like we once did. But hey, here's the good news. You, you, can't, you can't fix everybody, but you can work on yourself. And you can start doing the fifth commandment. Wherever you are in life, you can start honoring your father and your mother. So we want to look at this very practical uh, way to look at this commandment today. We want to answer the question, what does it mean to honor our father and mother? We want to answer the question, why is it so important? Why did God write it with his finger, etch it in stone, carve it in stone? And number three, how do we do it? What are practical ways to do that? So, those three questions that we want to answer. So, question number one, God wants us to know what it means. What does it mean? Well, God says, here, I'm going to tell you what it means. This is what it means. Honor your father and your mother. The word honor in Hebrew means to uh, – it's, it's the word kavod. It's used 156 times in the Old Testament – It means to be weighty, to be heavy, to be glorious. That's the word kavod. And when when we honor someone, we attach weight to their personhood, to their place, their position. Hey, you you, you have a weighty position. You have a, a glorious position. In the New Testament, when Paul says, honor your father and mother, obviously he's writing in Greek, not in Hebrew. And that word in the Greek means to prize, to revere, to to put a value on. And when we honor our father and mother, we put a value on the position that God has given them in our lives. So, very simply, honor is an attitude of respect that endures throughout life. Sometimes we get the idea that uh, the fifth commandment is for kids. It's just for little kids. Hey, little kids, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you that you'll live a long life. But it's not just for little kids, although little kids are definitely included. It's for everyone. And see, this commandment doesn't have a shelf life. It doesn't say honor your father and mother until you turn 18. And then you're on your own and do whatever you want. No, this is a, an attitude of respect that we give our parents all throughout our lives. Now, it does look different as you get older. So when we talk about children, 18 and under, living under the parents' roof, children are to obey their parents in the Lord. Do they have an attitude of respect? Of course. Yes, you honor. And you're 12 years old, you honor your parents. But you also obey your parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Why? Because you're living under their roof. And so they make the rules. They have house rules. And it's your job to obey your parents because you're not out on your own. You're under their roof. And we obey, Ephesians 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. See, 
Parents, God uses parents as a uh, representation of himself in the life of a child as they train up a child in the way that they should go. Now, parents are not God, but they serve as the representative of God, and no parent is a perfect parent. I'm not, you're not, we're not. Uh, but we serve, a, for our children, we serve as the, kind of the link between, uh, between God and the child. And, okay, so you obey me because you're supposed to do that. It is right in the Lord. You say, well, what if your parents ask you to do something that you shouldn't do? What if they ask you to steal? Should you do that? Obviously not. I mean, we must obey God rather than men, and so if your mom or dad is not an upstanding person, not a moral person, doesn't have a moral compass, and asks you to do something, hey, help me steal, help me lie, help me do this, help me do that, we don't do that. But in a normal sense of life, you obey your parents in the Lord. I heard about a mom, and she took her six-year-old son out to uh, the restaurant. And they had a deal at the restaurant, children four and under eat free. And so she told her six-year-old, she said, now listen, if they ask you, you tell them you're four because then we get to eat free. And so they go into the, the restaurant, they sit down, and the, what do you want to order? The waiter comes, what do you want to order? And she orders. And then uh, and she said, and, and my son will have the, the special. And the waiter looked at the boy, and he said, son, how old are you? He said, four years old. He said, son, do you know what happens to little boys who lie? He said, yep, we get to eat free. <laughs> you obey your parents in the Lord unless they're asking you to sin against God, but that's obviously not what the Lord is uh, referencing here. And that's what we do as children because of the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. And when you're living under mom and dad's roof, you go by mom and dad's rules. But now as adults, when we get older, when we leave the nest, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. We start our own family. We revere our parents in the Lord. We always have that attitude of respect for our parents Leviticus 19.3, every one of you shall reverence his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. And so we have that attitude toward our parents. They stand in the place of God, so to speak, for us, and we always hold them in such high esteem and high regard. So that's what it means to honor your father and mother. Now, the second question, why is it so important? I mean, why did this one make the Ten Commandments? And why is this the, the foundational command that springs all of the horizontal commands? Well, not only does God want us to know what it means, but God wants us to know why it is so important. Now, what does the Lord say concerning a person who doesn't do this. You know, it's the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you'll live long in the land. But what if you don't do it? What if you say, I don't want to obey that. I don't want to honor my parents. My parents aren't honorable, so I'm not going to honor them. Deuteronomy chapter 21. If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or his mother, and when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them. Then his father and his mother shall seize him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gateway of his, house, of his hometown. And they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard, and he smells bad. I just added in the smell. I mean, it was just kind of, you know, it's going. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death. So you shall remove the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear of it and fear. Now, we don't have a record that they actually did this, but that was the command. This is how serious it is. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Jesus would never talk like that. Au contraire. Matthew chapter 15, 
when the Pharisees saying, hey, why do your, uh, why do your uh, disciples break the, the commandments? He said, they don't break the commandments. They break your traditions. But he said, let me ask you, why do you break the commandments of God? For he says in Matthew 15, 4, For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. He quotes from Exodus chapter 21, verse 17. Uh, it's a serious thing to curse your father and mother. It's a serious thing to disobey your parents. You know, in the New Testament, when we read in Romans 1, when we read in 2 Timothy 3, in the last days difficult times will come, and then it gives a laundry list of the sins that will happen in the last days when Paul in Romans 1 talks about when God gives a person over, a nation over, a society over to a depraved mind. He talks about all the sins. There's going to be murder. There's going to be greed. There's going to be uh, wickedness and arrogance. They're going to be haters of God. And he mentions disobedient to parents. He lumps it in there with all those horrible sins because that is a horrible, horrible sin. Now, why is this so important? Why does God put it in there? Why is it? We don't see it as, I mean, you murder somebody versus disobedience to parents. That's like saying, uh, comparing murder to uh, going, you know, 65 in a 55. I mean, it just doesn't seem like it's that big a deal. It's a huge deal. Honoring your parents teaches you to honor authority. Why does God have this in the Ten Commandments? Because it's so critical, because it teaches you about authority. Listen, your parents are not your peers. And parents don't try and be your kids' peers or your kids' pals. You're their parents. And right off the bat, honor your father and mother, that shows a kid, hey, Mom and dad have a position that I don't have. They have an elevated position. There is a gap in here between me and my parents, and I have to hold them in the highest regard because God commands me to do that. And so it teaches a kid early on about authority, and we honor authority. Now, they, they stand in the place of God. And they're to train us up in the fear and instruction of the Lord, the fear and admonition of the Lord. And so through our parents, th then we're to learn the fear of the Lord because that's the beginning point of everything. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and destruction. When you understand that God is God and I'm not God and you give God his rightful place as king and you take your rightful place as slave before the king of kings and lord of lords, that's what we teach our children. That's very primary and they do that through honoring their father and mother. That is the first step. And then they learn there is authority that God puts in life, authority structures that God puts in life. Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul says this, let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and those who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. You know, when you see people out on the street marching, no justice, no peace. We're going to destroy this town because there's no justice, therefore there's going to be no peace. Well, no justice, they're participating in no justice. They're perpetrating no justice when they're destroying people's properties. Anytime you see that, just know this is not of God because God is not the author of rebellion. You know who is the author of rebellion? Satan. Because he would, before he became Satan was Lucifer, the most beautiful angel God made. And what did he do? He rebelled against God. And he said, I'm not going to worship God. I'm going to make myself like the Most High God. He rebelled against God. He took a third of the angels with him in his rebellion, and he was cast down. Hey, when you participate in rebellion, just know that's not coming from the Lord. That is coming from the liar and the father of lies who is a murderer from the beginning who comes to steal and kill and destroy. So very, very important to 
honor authority, and that's baked in. God says, hey, this is really critical. Honor your father and mother because you need to learn to honor authority. And secondly, honoring your parents teaches you the value of family. The value of family, the importance of family. Now, to the Jews, family's everything. And if you couldn't have a child, and you're a, you're a Jewish girl and you can't have a child, you're devastated. We're going through the book of Genesis on Wednesday nights, and we talked about uh, Jacob, whose name got changed to Israel, who has 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, really important guy. Well, he has a wife, Rachel, and she can't have children. Remember, he, has, he had uh, Rachel whom he loved, and he got snookered into taking Leah, and Leah was of weak guys, but Rachel was beautiful in form and face. And what does that mean, Ray, Leah's of weak eyes? means she looks a whole lot better in the dark. And so he gets this girl, and, but she's very fertile. She's having a lot of kids, and her sister, uh, Rachel's not having any kids. And she says to Jacob, give me children lest I die. He said, well, am I in the place of God? I don't control the opening of your womb. But that's how, that's how much she wanted that. You read in 1 Samuel, Hannah, Hannah couldn't have any children, and she wept bitter tears asking the Lord to open her womb. Children, so important. Family, so important. In our world today, we've, we've lost the importance of family. And one of the things that we see if you keep up with culture, what's going on, uh, the, the government is trying to separate parents from children. Schools are trying to indoctrinate children away from their parents, teaching their uh, kids not uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but all sorts of perversion. And they don't want the parents to know. We separate the kids from the parents. Hitler did that with his Hitler youth, separating the kids and trying to break that bond between parents and children. God is teaching us how important family is. You think about in the book of Genesis, before God ever established the church, before he ever established education, before he ever established government, he established marriage and family. He established the home. And if you destroy the home, you destroy society. You destroy civilization. Because once the home goes, then everything else falls apart. A, a community is only as strong as its churches, and a church is only as strong as its marriages and families. I was talking to Coach Keith Jones when I was walking in. He, he's a coach. He'd been a coach at Texas High for a long, long time. And I said, you know, really... Teachers and coaches and educators, they see firsthand what's going on in the destruction of the family because it shows up in the kids, and the kids are angry, and they're dealing with angry kids, and there's no honor in the home, and mom and dad aren't honorable, and the kids aren't honoring mom and dad. And they grow up in a home where there are no rules, there are no out-of-bounds markers, everything is just wide open, and they come to school, and uh, what's the school supposed to do? Hey, you, you got to police these kids, you got to control these kids and corral these kids. They have no discipline. They have no respect for authority because that got broken down in the home. That's where it's supposed to be taught, in the home. And so now the the, the Students or the teachers, the coaches, the administrators, here, here's the problem. You fix it. Well, they can't fix that. How are you supposed to fix that? And there's such a rebellion toward authority. I mean, you, you have a, a conflict with the teacher. Well, that teacher, we're going to get that teacher fired. You have a conflict with the coach. We're going to go down there and straighten him out. You have a conflict with the principal. We're going to go down there and we're coming, uh, uh, coming for that person. Because we're going to rebel. There's not this sense of we yield to authority. We may not like it, but we yield to it. And so that sense of family, that sense of authority, that's baked in to the fifth commandment. I like what Barack Obama said. It's amazing that I would like anything he said. But uh, 
But some of you may remember in 2008, before he became president, he was Senator Barack Obama. He spoke at a church on Father's Day, and he said some things that made some people mad, but they were things that were true. He said this, the family is that most important foundation, and we are called to recognize and honor what every father is to that foundation. But if we are honest with ourselves, we will admit that too many fathers are missing in action. Too many fathers are AWOL, absent without leave, missing from too many lives and too many homes. They've abandoned their responsibilities. They're acting like boys instead of men. And the foundations of our families have suffered because of it. You and I know how true this is in the African-American community. We know that more than half of all black children live in single-parent households a number that has doubled, doubled, he said, since we were children. We know, that, we know the statistics that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They are more likely to have behavioral problems or run away from home or become teenage parents themselves, and the foundations of our community are weaker because of it. What he said is true. Now, I don't care what color you are. You can be purple. But if you don't have a strong family unit and you don't see the value of family as a father, as a mother, as a child who is commanded by God to honor his or her parents, the, the thing starts to unravel. And we're living in a society where it is unraveling right before our eyes. Hey, what does it mean to honor your father and mother? It means you have an attitude of respect for them. Why is it so important? Because it teaches the value of family. It teaches a child to honor authority. And thirdly, what are some practical ways to do it? God wants us to know practically how to do it. So, you know, I remember reading a book that a guy wrote, and he said that when he would listen to sermons, he would listen to the pastor go on and on and on, and then he would say to himself, he, he would write a note as he was taking notes, Y-B-H, yes, but how? Yes, but how? How do I do this? And so, when we talk about honoring your father and mother, maybe you're saying, well, Jeff, you don't know my father and mother. They're not very honorable. Okay? We have, there are a lot of parents that aren't very honorable. But you know, a, a husband is to love his wife even when she's not very lovable. A wife is to respect her husband even when he's not respectable. We do it in the Lord. We do it as servants of Christ. We do it because the Lord's commanded us to do that. We serve our uh, boss, our employer. Oh, Colossians 3 says you, you serve him as you are serving Christ, not because he is such a wonderful guy, perhaps, or she's such a wonderful lady, perhaps. It's because you're a believer and you're doing it as unto the Lord. And so for a child, we honor our parents. We have this attitude of respect for our parents not because they're respectable per se, but because God commands us to do it. So here are some very practical ways that you can honor your parents regardless of how old you are. You can honor your parents. First of all, you can express gratitude to your parents. Express gratitude to your parents. Let them know that you appreciate them. Let them know that you are thankful and grateful for the sacrifices that they made on your behalf. You know, you can do that in a phone call. You can do that in a visit. But I think even better than a phone call or a visit is a letter because that's something they can keep. That's something they can treasure. You send them a letter that really expresses the gratitude of your heart and you're thanking them for all that they did for you and they will read that and read that and read that and read that and put that in a safekeeping space so that they can pull it out again and read it and read it and read it and read it. Express your gratitude. And hey, we started this summer and so we have a lot of kids who are home now. 
And uh, that changes things for the summer, doesn't it? When your, uh, your child is home all summer and uh, maybe no job and uh, I'm bored. What, what is there to do? There's nothing to do. I'm bored. And we have less of that. When I was a kid, um, once you went through the four channels we had on TV, uh, it was like, go outside, read it. My mom would always say, read a book. Oh, it's not, it's summertime. I'm not reading a book. Well, then go outside. Quit beating your sister. You know, that kind of thing. You got to do something. But, but here's, I read this in my studies this week from Kevin DeYoung. He said, uh, how about this, kids? How about when your mom or dad asks you to do something? You do this chore. You do this assignment. You say, yes, mom. Yes, dad. Instead of, ah. Oh. Why do I have to do that? Uh, she didn't do it. Now you're making me do it. That's not fair. Don't do that stuff. That doesn't express a gratitude toward your parents. So learn how to say, yes, mom. Yes, dad. I will do that. We can express gratitude to our parents. Secondly, we can listen to our parents and heed their counsel and heed their commands if we're younger and we live under their roof. Listening to them. What do we say honor means to, to attach weight to, to be heavy, to be weighty? And when you come before your parents, you're, you're going to get counsel from somebody who, who carries weight. That doesn't mean, especially as an adult, that doesn't mean you're going to necessarily do what they tell you to do or what they counsel you to do, but you want to hear from them because they're further down the road than you are. They've been where you are now. We have to remember that because in, in most of our lives, our parents are, are, you know, 20 years down the road from where we are. And so they can tell you things. Hey, you got to watch out for this. You got to watch out for that. I, I had a problem with this. And uh, if, if you, you know, if you don't watch it, you're going to have that same problem. I don't want you to, uh, to fall and fail where I did. And so they give you counsel. And we need to listen to them, to hear and to heed their counsel. I had the privilege, my nephew, Josh, is uh, my sister, my middle sister's youngest son. And uh, Debbie and I, God used us in his, his life and his wife's life, and they both trusted Christ, and they're raising their kids in the fear and the instruction of the Lord. Well, his dad, Josh's dad, David, um, he is going through dementia. And so he loves his boys, but he can't be there for his boys like he would like to, no doubt. And, and Josh can't talk to his dad about issues like he would like to. And so I told Josh, I said, now listen, Josh, I'm not your dad, but I would love to be there for you. Anytime I can help you, you just call me and I'll, I'll help you any way I can. Not trying to usurp your dad, but I just want to be there for you. And so he called me through an issue just recently. And it was such a, a blessing to be able to minister to him and for him to come to ask me, well, Jeff, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And, and what do you think the Lord wants me to do? And, and see, that's a blessing for a child. It's a blessing for a parent when the child comes and says, what do you think about this? And listen, in the day and age in which we live, we're hearing from society that we need to let kids decide on gigantic issues concerning gender and uh, they can make decisions apart from parents to say, well, you know, I'm nine years old and I think uh, even though I'm uh, XY male, I'd like to be a female and mutilate their bodies and take drugs to mutilate their bodies and, and this idea that parents can't get involved in that. How ridiculous is that? Bill Maher, the liberal, he says, uh, you know, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a pirate. I'm glad my parents didn't take me to the hospital to cut off my leg and rip out my eye. I mean, this is, this is insanity. But we didn't always used to be insane as a society. And you get that from some of the old television programs. And in the old television programs, you know what? Men were strong and men had wisdom and men stood up for their children. Men like Andy Taylor in the Andy Griffith Show. And the job of kids is to listen to mom and dad, two people 
who naturally love you. So how do we honor our parents? We listen to them. We heed them if we're younger, but we hear them out regardless, and we get their counsel. Thirdly, we can seek to live a godly life. John said in 3 John chapter 1, verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear of my children walking in the truth. And that's true for a spiritual leader, as John was talking about spiritual children walking in the truth. But that's so true for mom and dad. Mom and dad want to see their kids walk in the truth. They want to see their kids make good decisions. Now, you hear this all the time. Well, I just want my children to be happy. Well, if they obey the Lord... That's when you're going to find real joy in life. That's when you're going to find peace in life. If you disobey your parents and dishonor your parents, God says, you're not, it's not going to go well with you. You're not going to live long on the earth. Your life will not be good. I can't bless you if you're doing that. So as sons and daughters, we can make a big difference in our parents' lives if we live a godly life, if we live a life that brings honor to the Lord, because a life that brings honor to the Lord brings honor to your parents. Proverbs chapter 23, the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and who who begets a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and your mother be glad, and let her rejoice who gave birth to you. One of the last things that my dad ever said to me, now, remember, my mom and dad, Catholic. So, youngest son, Jeff, gets saved senior year in high school, goes off to college at the University of Texas, gets together with godly guys, starts growing in the Lord, joins a Baptist church, horrors uh, to my parents, and then tells my parents, I need to get baptized. You need to do what? You've already been baptized. No, I need to be baptized. I mean, you would have thought I shot their dog. They just didn't understand that at all. And they're like, oh, okay, well, I mean, you know, I appealed to them. I didn't just say this is the way it's going to be. Uh, they didn't want me to do it, but they weren't going to stop me from doing it. And then live my life and get called in the ministry and leave my job to go in the ministry. They're scratching their head. What in the world are you doing and so then I become a, a pastor of a Baptist church. And they're thinking, what is, uh, he's gone off the deep end. Before my dad died, he told me, Jeff, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Hey, when you live your life, to glorify the Lord <laughs> makes your parents proud of you, and it's a blessing to them. We know that when a, a child is in the far country, to use prodigal son language, breaks our heart. We see our children making bad decisions, breaks our heart. We don't want to see that. I have no greater joy and to hear of my children walking in the truth. Fourthly, practical ways we can honor our parents. We can include them in our lives. Parents like to be included. Now, this is as you, get, uh, as you start getting older. Now, when you're a teenager, you know, you go from, from grade school, you want your parents involved in everything. Middle school, okay, I want them involved in pretty much everything. Then you get to high school. Parents are, they become so dumb. Have you noticed that? Well, they just don't, they, might, they don't know anything. I remember as a high school student, I would drive by and this friend of mine, his parents, they would mow the yard on Friday evening. And I thought, what a couple of nerds. I mean, Friday is when you go out and they're mowing the yard and he's got on tennis shoes and black dress socks. <laughs> Nerd alert. I mean, just loser deluxe. That's what, I mean, that's what kids think about uh, parents. They're just, they're just so out of touch. And so, we, we, we start to kind of di distance. We don't want them in our lives as much. And then we get older than that, and 
if things aren't good with our parents, and some people have parents that are very, very difficult, and they're, they're too controlling, they want to be in, you got to set boundaries, and I realize that. But you always want to include them. You don't want to exclude them from your life. You hear about some people, and they say, well, you know, uh, mom and dad, if you don't toe the line, if you don't do what I want, you're not going to see your grandkids anymore. They use that as a weapon. That's not honoring your father and mother. To honor your parents means you include them as best you can. And if you have a father or mother who is uh, bipolar or an alcoholic, a drug addict, you've got to be careful with how you do that. But you always want to have an attitude of honor, including them in our lives. And then lastly, we can seek to make things right with them. Hey, maybe you're here, and this is a tough commandment because you don't have a good relationship with your mom and dad. Your mom and dad have hurt you, and you, you give them the stiff arm. You're like, my life is better when I don't talk to them, when I stay away from them. And then you come across the fifth commandment, and it doesn't have an expiration date, and you say, I am not attaching weight to my parents. I'm not revering them. I'm not esteeming them. And we don't have a relationship, and there is tremendous distance. You need to do what you need to do to make things right with them. I was listening to an interview not too long ago, an interview with Dr. Charles Stanley, who recently went home to be with the Lord. And Charles Stanley has had his share of difficulties in life, big difficulties in life. Pastor of First Baptist Church in Atlanta, I mean, that you, you read about his life, the difficulties he went through in his church, the difficulties he went through in his marriage. But even before that, the difficulties he went through as a kid growing up, his dad died when he was uh, just an infant in the first year of his life, never knew his biological father. His mother remarries, and his stepdad is angry and violent and abusive. Charles said, he never said one kind, encouraging thing to me. And he said, the thing that made it so terrible is what he did to my mom and how he was abusive with my mom and how he got physical with my mom. And he said, man, the person I love more than anyone on the earth was my mother, and he was hurting my mother. And he said, I was a 12-year-old, and one day my dad was coming, my stepdad coming at my mother to choke her. And he said, I stood in the gap and I pushed him away and I said, if you ever touch her again, I'm going to kill you. Well, then years pass. Charles is a pastor. Charles is in ministry. Charles has his own family. He said he was getting ready to preach on forgiveness and the Lord convicted his heart and said, Charles, you have unforgiveness in your heart. And he said, no, Lord, I don't. And he thought through all the people in his circle. And he said, I don't have any bad feelings toward anybody uh, that I can think of. And he said, let's go back. What about your stepfather? And Charles was convicted because he said, I had unforgiveness in my heart toward my stepfather for what he did, not so much to me, but what he did to my mother. And so he said, I knew I needed to get this right. So he went, he and his wife went to see his stepfather and his mom and they sat down at the table, and Charles said to his stepdad, he said, he said, John, I need to ask you to forgive me. And John said, oh, I don't need to worry about that. That's the fine water under the bridge. He goes, no. He said, I need to ask you to forgive me because I've held on to an unforgiving spirit toward you. And Charles said, I didn't qualify it with because you did this and that and the other. He said, if I had done that, everything would have fallen apart and he would have gotten mad. So I just owned my part of the deal. And I said, I want you to forgive me for my unforgiving spirit. And he said his stepdad got up from the table, came across to where Charles was, embraced him, and started to weep. And he said, Charles, would you forgive me? were all the things that I did when you were a kid growing up that were so awful. And Charles, he, he's probably 80 years old when he's telling this story, and the tears are welling up in his eyes as he thinks about that moment. And he said, that was a huge thing for me to forgive my stepfather. 
and to ask him to forgive me. Hey, maybe your mom, your dad's gone. You say, what can I do? How can I honor my father and my mother? You can get things right. Even though they're dead, you can get things right. My friend John Finch produced the movie The Father Effect. You can watch it free. We've shown it at the the church. You can watch it free on YouTube. It's a powerful movie about the impact dads have on their kids and how so many people carry around a father wound. And in the show, he has, in, in the documentary, he has this guy, Larry. And Larry was saying how his father was dying in the VA hospital. And he knew the nurse, and he said, please call me and tell me, uh, you know, when, when the time gets down to the wire uh, so I can say goodbye to my dad. And so she called, and she said, you need to hurry, and you need to get here. And so he got there as fast as he could. He said he went into the hospital room, and his dad was passed out on the bed. And he said he grabbed his dad's hand, and he just poured out his heart. He said, I can't remember all the things I said. But he said, I just, there were tears and I poured out my heart to my dad and I told him how much I loved him and I just forgave him for all the things and the hurts and things. And he said, and then I got done. And he said, I turned around and the nurse was there and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, Larry, I don't know how to tell you this, but your dad died an hour ago. She said, I didn't want to interrupt you as you were talking to him, but he didn't hear any of it. He had already passed away. And Larry said, that's okay. I didn't do that for him. I did that for me. I did that for me. I needed to get that out of my heart. And Larry today can say, hey, I honor my father and mother even though they're gone because I have a high regard for them. Look at it again. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you, that it may go well with you. It's the commandment with a promise, and you can get in on that good promise today. My friend, we're all guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. We are sinners before God. That's why Jesus came. He came to pay the price for our sin. He came to be our Savior. He died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And if you'll put your faith and trust in him, he will save you now and forever. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I surrender my life, my heart, my all to you. Forgive me, cleanse me, save me, come to live inside me, change my life, and I promise to follow you all the days that you give me. In Jesus' name. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. If you just prayed that prayer with me, please let us know. The contact information is there. We want to pray with you and help you any way we can. Listen, you're important to God and you're important to us. And we're here for you.